first off, we make policy for the entire country, uh, so we look at housing markets across the country. Uh, what we have seen in recent months has been a broadening of the recovery in the housing market across the country. That's welcome. Uh, there are very low levels of transactions uh, through the recession. It's just starting to pick up in some, in some regions. Uh, what we're vigilant to, and we are vigilant about risks around the housing market, is to ensure that risks aren't building up for the medium term. In other words, that banks have enough capital uh, when they underwrite these new mortgages, and very importantly, that individuals who are taking out mortgages can afford those mortgages over the entire life of the mortgages. We don't want to build up another big debt overhang that is going to hurt individuals, but is very much going to slow the economy in the medium term. So you have a range of tools, so to speak, at your disposal to yes. deal with any concerns. The last line of defense then is putting up interest rates. What are those in between and have you or are you going to deploy them? Yes, well, it's the right question. The first thing we did is to take our foot off the accelerator, if you will. So at the end of last year, we stopped uh, subsidizing, if you will, uh, new mortgages uh, through something called the Funding for Lending Scheme. Uh, we stopped subsidizing capital for some uh, institutions for the mortgage lending. We did those under extreme circumstances to get the market going. Um, we did two other things, uh, the collective we. Uh, first, we put in new underwriting standards for mortgages to make sure that there's not the slippage uh, in uh, the terms under which banks uh, extend mortgages to individuals. They didn't used to, for example, verify income uh, prior to the crisis, which is uh, uh, unwise at best uh, and dangerous at worst. Uh, and then secondly, what we're doing is we're, we're stress testing the banks. We're, 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 we're seeing how they would respond if house prices fell by a large amount. That's what we've done and what we're doing. We could do more. We could uh, take steps around affordability to test whether or not individuals can afford mortgages at much higher interest rates. Um, we could uh, limit amounts uh, of certain types of mortgages that banks uh, could uh, undertake. Uh, we could provide advice. The Chancellor has asked us uh, if uh, we would provide advice on uh, changing uh, terms uh, to help to buy. All those things are, are possibilities, uh, well, and we'll consider them all. Well, there are things out of your control. Help to buy, you just touched on it there, one of them. Is, is the government not helping you by using help to buy? Well, uh, two things there. First, uh, help to buy, which is a government policy, was put in place uh, for uh, reasons of access, to uh, provide access to certain types of borrowers, mainly first-time buyer buyers uh, who needed high loan-to-value uh, mortgages in order to get on the property ladder. Uh, it's a pretty targeted program. It's a relatively small program at, at this point. But it could grow a lot, and it could change uh, attitudes in other parts of the mortgage market. That's why we have to be mm. vigilant. But I mean, that's but the very we, thing. I mean, in informal in informal discussions, perhaps with the chancellor, are you likely to say, "Well, Mr. Osborne, it's those high loan-to-value mortgages that we are most concerned about." It, we would be concerned if there were a rapid increase in high loan-to-value mortgages across. Uh, the banks. Uh, so away from help to buy, if that were much more generalized, and uh, particularly if it were accompanied by very high loan to income uh, ratios. We've seen that creeping up. It's something we're watching closely. With respect to help to buy, uh, we will provide advice to the government. We will do so publicly uh, if we provide it. Uh, we'll provide advice to the government if we think there's, uh, there should be changes to that. The ultimate decisions will be decisions of the government. I would emphasize, though, that we do talk to the Treasury. I do talk to the Chancellor. We try to be as coordinated as possible in ensuring that there is a sustainable development in the housing market, and that's not in the short term, it's for the medium well, term. Well, I mean, is there any forward guidance on this? We'll talk a bit more about uh, formal forward guidance, so to speak, okay. a little later on, but is there any forward guidance on this? You talked about loan to income ratios, you're keeping a close eye on them. They're around about, what, according to your charts, seven, seven and a half percent, pretty close to the peak level. If they hit it, if they hit eight or nine, would that be the point at which you say we've got to move interest rates? It's not a precise trigger, um, and it partly depends on individual circumstances. There's some a, a first-time buyer, for example, if 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 you're lending at a higher loan to loan to income ratio for a household, uh, the couples in their uh, late twenties, early thirties, uh, they have prospects of income uh, increasing over the lifetime. That that you can have more comfort there uh, than really stretching later in life, as 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 one example. Um, but we. We are looking at that. Um, the, the level of higher loan-to-income uh, mortgages, ones above four and a half of five times loan-to-income, uh, potentially could store up bigger problems for the future. 
um, and we need to, would need to be careful, we need to be calibrated, we need to be proportionate if we were to suggest some adjustments to the amount of these type of mortgages that uh, banks should underwrite. Of course, as you know, in the United States at the moment, the big concern uh, when it comes to so-called subprime lending is uh, uh, surrounding the auto market, the, the car market. Can you see problems coming from other areas of consumer indebtedness? Well, we haven't, uh, our mandate uh, at the Bank of England is to, is to watch all aspects of, uh, of, of, of credit. Um, so it would include that as well as all aspects of the financial markets. Um, we're really just starting to see broader consumer credit pick up. We haven't seen that marked um, extension, deterioration, if you will, of, of, of terms in auto lending in the UK as, as has been seen uh, in the United States, uh, but it is something we watch closely. I would say that I'd go back to where you focused. When we look at domestic risks, the biggest risk to financial stability and therefore to the durability of the expansion, uh, those risks center in the housing market and that's why we're as focused on it. As I mean, some of these measures you tried in the country you left behind. There's pretty much a boom going on in Canada. Are you in danger of being, having been a governor in two countries that left behind him a housing boom? Uh, well, two things. Um, first, uh, Canada, I, I left Canada at a time when inflation's at target um, and the Canadian economy was the best performing G7 economy. Um, but the housing market's pretty toppy. The housing market, the housing market in Canada um, in terms of valuation is about 50% less in terms of valuation metrics than the housing market in the United Kingdom. So let's focus on the United Kingdom. The issues around the housing market in the United Kingdom, uh, the longer term structural issues, as I think you know, is there are not sufficient houses built in the UK. To go back to Canada, half as many people in Canada as in the UK, the same number of houses are built every year in Canada, or sorry, twice as many houses are built every year in Canada as in the UK which just gives you a sense of the orders of magnitude of okay. supply problems. So that would help you out, build more that houses? Would help, that would help us out. We can't, we're not going to build a single house at the Bank of England, um, and we can't influence that. What we can influence, and we will do this as appropriate, is whether the banks are strong enough, do they have enough capital against risks in the housing market, whether underwriting standards are tough enough so that people can get mortgages if they can afford them, but they can't if they won't. And, and by reinforcing both of those, we can reduce the risks that come from a housing market that has deep, deep structural problems. And could the government also help you out? Another thing not in your control, fiscal measures. Ed Balls, the Shadow Chancellor, suggesting that to help cool particularly the London market, something like a, a mansion tax would help. Well, that's, uh, th those are political decisions. Uh, they're, they're fiscal measures, I, I, and there are particularities in the London market. Uh, there is a, a very large cash market in London, uh, which has a heavy uh, foreign, uh, foreign purchaser um, element to it. From our mandate's perspective, those dynamics don't cause risk to the British economy. They, 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 they cause other issues that are, that are political issues um, that are rightly addressed by the political authorities. What, what are the risks? What are the external risks to the fairly rosy picture at the moment for inflation, for growth? You've detailed them all. Of course, there's always the unknown and the known unknowns out there. There's the Eurozone. There's international crises maybe coming from Ukraine. What do you identify as the main risks? I would, I, I would, put, I would say three. This isn't exhaustive, but you mentioned the Eurozone. Um, now the Eurozone has, has improved quite considerably so that the risk of a, a sort of catastrophic outcome is not there at the moment. But it's a very weak recovery in the Eurozone. Uh, and uh, this is our major export market. And the combination of weakness in the Eurozone and strength of sterling creates real challenges for our exporters. That creates challenges for the balance of the recovery. So that is one. Uh, the second issue uh, are broader risks in emerging markets, China, geopolitics, I'd, I'd, I'd group those together. The, the adjustment in the Chinese uh, financial sector is considerable. That's going to weigh on Chinese growth. That will have knock-on effects. The third risk, uh, which we've identified, is that in financial markets as a whole, um, the level of volatility, um, a measure of risk, but the level of volatility is very low across a, a wide range of asset classes. That won't be sustained as the recovery continues. At some point, there's going to be an adjustment. That adjustment could be quite sharp. 
that would tighten financial conditions, and that would provide a new uh, headwind for the recovery. Um, so what we're trying to do in our, way, in our small way to minimize that risk globally, make sure our banks are well capitalized first. Secondly, around policy, to provide as much certainty as possible, but no more certainty than we can provide. As the recovery comes, we can provide, or as the expansion progresses, we can provide certainty forward guidance on where we think the medium term path of interest rates is going to be. We've done that, limited gradual increases, very important for households and businesses to understand that. But we can't provide certainty about the exact timing of when we start that journey. Let me ask you about another uh, feature of the fairly rosy picture. As I say, you talked and have talked about the fact that it seems that real wages for a long time, for the first time for a long time, are going to outstrip inflation. Does that mean the cost of living crisis is over? Well, it is, seems, at the, uh, you cho chose your words carefully, for the first time for a long time, just about to begin to rise above the rate of inflation. So uh, that's, uh, that's a pretty low bar for an expansion. Um, uh, we would expect to see sustained real wage growth over time. Um, historically, one expects to see something in the high threes, about 4% real wage growth. So if inflation, uh, sorry, wage growth, uh, inflation 2%, you have, you have the balance above that of, of real wage growth. We're just at a point right now where the basically uh, earnings growth is matching inflation. We expect it to pick up because we expect productivity to pick up. Um, that needs to happen for the expansion to really So you see the cost of living crisis ending soon? Uh, we see real wage, real wages turning positive uh, soon. That's in our forecast. Okay, you like your footballing analogies, and uh, you said at your quarterly inflation report that uh, the economy was recovering. We're more or less in the in the group stages of the the World Cup. That's your goal to entrench that recovery. Now I've looked at the odds of uh, England coming out of their group in the World Cup. It's nine to four, two and a quarter to one. Is that about the odds of this recovery being entrenched? Well, I'm I, I, more um, constructive on uh, England's odds, um, and, um, uh, but uh, in terms of the economy, uh, we have many of the elements in place for an expansion, but we have just as many, we're in a tough group, if you will. Just but, as England, so it's about two to one against. England's in a tough group. I wouldn't say I wouldn't put it against. We have, uh, we have, we have greater, it's tough to win the World Cup. But we have greater prospects of having a durable expansion. But we're in a tough group, to go back to the analogy. Um, you know, the Italy equivalent uh, is the fact that we have very weak demand abroad and we have uh, persistent strength of the currency. Uh, the Uruguay uh, equivalent are risks in the housing market. Uh, even the Costa Rica uh, equivalent is the, uh, is, is the issues around um, uh, having real wages grow. All of, those, all of those elements have to be in place for this to be a durable recovery. And tell me, Governor, um, being in post, what, I suppose coming up for a year now, what do you make of the, the Bank of England, your experience here, coming from, to us, a relatively new country uh, in Canada, to this institution, uh, an institution that was probably lending money to the trappers that colonized Canada <laughs> in the first place? Uh, have you found it a stuffy place? Or have you found it a place that's in need of reform and just some of its internal structures? Well, I, I think two things. One, I, I haven't found the, the first point. Um, what I've found is uh, a group of tremendously talented uh, and energetic uh, men and women who are, who are dedicated to public service. So exactly the type of people you want in an institution like that. With respect to reform though, there is a huge reform uh, need here because the Bank of England has been given all these new powers. You rightly focused on issues around housing. Well that wasn't, we didn't have any responsibility, direct responsibility prior to the crisis for these types of risks. As I emphasize, we can't eliminate all those risks, uh, but we can address some of them and we do have the powers to do that. We now have the ability to make sure the banks are resilient and safe, the insurance companies are as well. So what we need to do is use all of these responsibilities in a way that's coordinated, uh, consistent, coherent, uh, to help do our bit to deliver that. But are you also aware of uh, the responsibility, I suppose, of the Bank of England to represent the society we, which you're in. I looked, uh, I went to the quarterly inflation report and I looked down the line there and as you know, five white males, Spencer, Charlie, Mark, you, Nils and Paul. That's changing, isn't it? Is that in part because you want to reflect the society that you exist in? Well, it, we certainly do. Um, and uh, as you know, um, the MPC, of, uh, we were representatives of the MPC. Uh, the MPC's uh, uh, Manute 
uh, Manoush Shafiq is, is joining the bank uh, as a deputy governor, will join the MPC. Uh, we would expect more uh, women on the MPC over time. Um, but, but what we can directly affect as this institution, the MPC and members MPC, FPC, those are decisions of the government, um, what we can directly affect are the people we recruit, uh, the people we develop, the people we promote, and core to that reform of the Bank of England is a commitment to ensure that we reflect the diversity of the United Kingdom. And, so more and, women, more ethnic minorities? Uh, with, without question. Uh, we have specific plans to do so, uh, from recruitment right through to development, uh, and we're making a series of changes to reflect that. That, like many of our initiatives, has to be a medium-term goal because they have to be sustained. This isn't about a single headline, a single hire, uh, but it's about a broad approach. And can I just ask you, um, when you took on the job, you uh, said you were going to explore the issue of becoming a British citizen yourself. Are you continuing with that? And if so, how's it going? Well, uh, I, in order to, uh, I think the, the term the Prime Minister used was to take up my right uh, to British citizenship. Uh, in order to, uh, to do so, uh, there's a residency requirement. Uh, that residency requirement. I think you fulfill that. I haven't. Oh. Uh, I, I've lived in the UK for 10 years uh, previously, but <clears throat> one needs to live here for five years in order to then start the process. So I'm, uh, I'm 10 months in, uh, Dermot. Okay, but when you fulfill that uh, residency requirement, you will go through it. You go through the lessons, Magna Carta, Waterloo, and all that? Yeah, big document. Magna Carta, <laughs> okay, very I know good. what that one means. Okay, Governor, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very indeed. much, Dermot. A pleasure. Good to Great. see you.